Hello, seventh grade. I have a joke for you. Why is chess blasphemous? Because according to the rules of chess, bishops can move in a cardinal direction. If you know the directions of a compass called cardinal directions when they move a certain way. I feel like the joke isn't as good if I have to explain it, but when I first got hold of it, I thought, that is a good joke. I'm going to share that with seventh grade. And the reason I was uh, making a joke about bishops is because in 1 John chapter 4, we're actually going to talk about uh, magisterium, which is tied in with apostolic succession and the bishops. All right. So, um, John chapter 4, he's talking again about uh, the false teachers, and he's going to contrast them with members of the church, Christians. So, about the false teachers, he says, they are of the world, therefore, what they say is of the world. And the world listens to them. We are of God. Whoever knows God listens to us, and he who is not of God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So it's pretty clear here. John is drawing a pretty clear distinction between those who remain within the church and those who are outside of it. Christians are inside of the church. The false teachers who he's attacking are outside of it. Um, and he makes this distinction by uh, talking about the authority that the church has over her doctrines, over her teachings, right? Uh, and he says, members of the church are of God, and if you belong to the church, then you recognize the authority that the apostles have over all of the Christians, right? The false teachers who reject this authority are not of God, right? And so he says, you should listen to us, the apostles, because we are guided by the Holy Spirit, whereas these false teachers are not. They are guided by the spirit of error instead. So what is John talking about when he's referring to the authority of the apostles? Well, this is uh, the authority that Christ gave directly to the 12 apostles. Um, and he also gave it to St. Paul as well. Um, in St. Paul's... Uh, conversion, he, he, he also becomes an apostle. Um, so these apostles form the teaching authority of the church. And there's a word for that today um, called the magisterium. So in the Catholic church, the Catholic church is hierarchical. So at the very top, you have the Pope, of course, um, who we believe is a successor of St. Peter. And then you have all the bishops of the world, right? All 5,000 plus bishops all over the world. And these are the successors of the apostles. So they inherit the apostles' authority, right? And together, the bishops and the pope make up the magisterium, or the teaching authority of the church. Right? So as Catholics, we believe that the pope has special magisterium. That means he has special authority that different than the others, and this has to do with Peter's primacy, but we're not going to get into that right now. We're just going to talk about magisterium in general. So as Catholics, you are required to obey the magisterium because the Holy Spirit guides the magisterium and speaks through it. Right? And then, of course, false teachers, those outside, uh, follow the spirit of error. Instead. So John is basically saying you're either going to follow the Holy Spirit or you're going to follow the spirit of error. There's only two categories you could fall into, one or the other. Um, now, I should note that there are different levels of magisterium. So there are certain things from the magisterium that all Catholics have to 100% believe in and obey, like the divinity of Christ, for example. All Catholics are required to believe in the divinity of Christ and the resurrection. There are other things in the magisterium that you don't have to fully believe, but we're not going to get into get into all of that this year. That's that's really complicated. So, for example, sometimes 
like a pope will write something and you don't necessarily have to believe or follow what the pope writes right now if the pope speaks with his full magisterium then you do have to right but most of the time when the bishops and the pope speak they're not using their magisterial authority they're just talking about their personal opinion all right beloved let us love one another for love is of god god is love in this the love of God was made manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world. Okay, so um, uh, when John says God is love and therefore we have to love one another, right? He's talking about divine filiation. He's talking about caritas. But he's also suggesting something else. And these are divine attributes or divine characteristics that God has. So John is saying everything that's good about you is in some small way a reflection of a divine attribute of God, right? So all the virtues you have reveal something about the nature of God, right? So if you are uh, honest or brave or courageous or merciful or trustworthy, right? These are all virtues that people have. All of these virtues originate in God. In, in some way, they are all uh, an indicator of divine filiation right? you inherit them from God right so God's perfections are the basis for your spiritual capacity so everything that's great about you is great because it comes from God's nature right so for example because God is love that makes us capable of loving one another right? that's what John's talking about Right? We're supposed to love one another because God is love. And so by loving another person, we are uh, reflecting that divine attribute of God, a.k.a. caritas. Okay, so how does God's love manifest? A handful of ways. So John says it manifests in creation. So the world around us is a manifestation of God's love. The world did not have to exist, right? But it does. Why? Because of divine love. Uh, also in the gifts that he gives to us individually. So these would be our virtues, but also our uh, talents, abilities, things like that. God's love is also manifested in our continued existence and relationship to God even after the fall. So after the fall of man in the Garden of Eden, the relationship that human beings had to God was broken in a fundamental and permanent way. But out of love, God maintained a relationship with us throughout time. And then of course, most importantly, God's love is manifested in the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, and ascension. All right. In this love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No man has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. So he's still talking about God's divine attribute of love, which gives us the capacity to love him and to love one another. So John is saying that we don't initiate our loving relationship with God, right? When a baby is born, a baby doesn't think to himself, oh, I'm so grateful to be alive, I need to thank God. No, babies have no concept of God um, or really even of themselves, right? It takes a while before a human being is capable of loving God. Right? And the way John understands this, the way that, that a human being becomes capable of loving God is because God has given that human being grace to love him in return. Right? So God initiates the love, and then the human being responds to that love. Right? So in other words, God reaches out to us first. We don't reach out to God first. All right, so there's a very famous saint, St. Alphonsus Liguori. Uh, and he has a theory that's very interesting. He says that it would have been possible for God to have saved humanity without dying on the cross, right? Because he's God, God is omnipotent, he could have done whatever he wanted. 
So it would have been possible for God to avoid the, uh, uh, the second person of the Trinity incarnating and dying on the cross. Right? But, he says, because he died on the cross, he actually did more than save us from our sins. It was also a demonstration of love. Right? So according to Ligori, the reason God died on the cross is primarily to save us, but furthermore to demonstrate divine love for us. All right. Then John says, because of the incarnation and death of Christ, we owe God love. Right? Um, but it's hard to love what we have never seen. This is what he's talking about when he says, no man has ever seen God. Right? So the closest thing we can do to love God, to fulfill our debt, our obligation to love God, is to love our neighbor out of our love for God. Again, to tap into that uh, virtue that we possess that is a reflection of the divine attributes that God possesses, caritas. All right, last one. Uh, God is love, and he who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. Fast a little bit, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, for fear has to do with punishment. Okay, so John here is going to talk about the relationship between love and fear, right? So, uh, here's basically how it works. He starts off with a premise. He says, that which we love becomes a part of us. So by loving God, God becomes a part of us. Um, likewise, we become that which we love. So therefore, in loving God, we take on a part, a very small, tiny part of God's divine nature. Right? This doesn't mean that we become like God on earth. That's not what happens. Um, but when we love God, we, in a very small way, take on, take God into our being. Right? But this could work the other way, too. Right? If you become that which you love, if you love a sinful thing, then by necessity, you yourself would become full of sin. You'd be sinful. All right, then he shifts to talking about fear. And basically, John is saying there's two ways to fear God. There's a good way and a bad way. So the bad way is something called servile fear. And this is something that some of the heretics of the early church thought about fearing God. So servile fear means you see God as a punisher, and that's it, right? You don't want to offend God because you're afraid of being punished by God. You're afraid of going to hell. Right? And John says, servile fear is not good. It has no place in the Christian soul, right? Because servile fear is, is doing the right things for the wrong reason, basically. Instead, he says you have to have something called filial fear, which means you dread sin, you reject sin because it cuts you off from God, right? Uh, so filial fear is actually an act of love. It's a form of caritas. Servile fear is kind of like animalistic, right? It's kind of like when you train your dog by using like positive and negative reinforcement. Right? That's kind of how servile fear works. John is saying servile fear is not how a Christian is supposed to relate to God. We're not like dogs that he's training, right? We're, we're adopted children of God, we're um, divine filiation, right? Finally, a quick note about punishment, right? Uh, John is not saying it's, it's bad to fear punishment, right? In fact, he says punishment is good if it comes from God because it's, it's just and it's merciful. Right? God punishes because he desires to restore us to his grace. Right? So punishment can be a good thing. Um, but again, he wants us to focus on filial fear, not servile fear. All right, that's it. We'll do chapter five tomorrow.